Hello, everyone, and welcome to our next video lecture. So, oh, I guess I'll just jump in. So, last class, we should have talked about um, the steps for defining a probability distribution. So, They were one, describe a phenomenon. Two, describe all possible outcomes. which we called our sample space, the space of all possible outcomes, the sample space. And three, assign a probability to every possible outcome. So hopefully in last class, I went over an example of all of this with you. And for the beginning of this lecture, I actually want to go over a less obvious example. We were working before with a sample space that had a discrete and finite number of different possible outcomes. But what if our sample space were huge? And I'm going to give us an example of that right now. And it should, I hope, look very familiar to you. So I'm going to do, I'm going to follow our three steps. So the first thing I'm going to do is describe a phenomenon, right? Suppose we choose a random score from a very large Distribution. Oh, very large population of test scores. Where these scores are normally distributed. with mean mu equals 100 and standard deviation sigma equals 10. <clears throat> so this should look like many of the normal like problems that we have done so far in this class. And you should know, <clears throat> I'm actually just on the first, so I've described a problem. It looks like a normal distribution. This should look like a problem we've done before already. But in the, content, in the context of defining a probability distribution, I've only so far done this first step right here. So how would I do the second step? Describe all possible outcomes. And the thing to notice here is all possible outcomes in this case is all real numbers. You could have a score of 100 right on mu, but you could also have 101 point three 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 right there are an infinite amount of different numbers you could choose and that's kind of an issue because part three we want to assign in fact i'm going to write this so infinite and that's kind of an issue because when we get to assigning probabilities 
How do we assign a probability to every single real number? I mean, I guess we could give every single real number a really, really small number, but no matter how small you make that number, if you try to give a non-zero probability to every single real number, all those little numbers are going to add up and it's gonna be something greater than one. And probabilities always have to add up to one, right? So what we do, so what we say is, we can't, assign a non-zero probability to every possible score. But suppose So I can't do a probability every single possible score, but suppose we wanted to know the probability of the event scores that are less than 15. As we know, or I hope we know, it was just a big subject of our most recent midterm, is this we can calculate. And we do it using a, mortal, a, a normal model or a normal distribution. So what would this look like? We would just, remember you find your z-score, 115 minus 110 over 10. This is 15 over 10 or 1.5. Plug that in into norm.s.dist, 1.5 comma one. And this should get you, if you went ahead and did it, Right, so <clears throat> actually I asked for a probability, so I shouldn't report this in percentage. This is 0.9332, okay? So there's a big idea here. This shouldn't look like any sort of pr new problem, right? I asked, you, I asked you a question about the probability of, a normal of, of an event in a normal distribution happening, which corresponded with an area under the curve calculation. And we used our Excel, we used our z-score calculation and our Excel function to find that. The big idea here is that what we had done previously with normal distributions is also applicable to this new idea of defining probability distributions. And the big idea, the big takeaway, I'm even gonna write it down, We use density curves to model probability distributions where the number of outcomes is infinite. Okay. So the way we get around this problem, the way we get around having so many different numbers that we have to assign probabilities to is instead of assigning a probability to every single number, we just use a density curve, a known probability distribution to describe the phenomenon. And then we find the area under the curve calculation to do any sort of meaningful probability calculations. So 
This is like a combination of our new idea of defining a probability distribution and our old idea of working with density curves. And you will get plenty of practice with this, I hope, in our upcoming homework. All right, next thing I want to talk about. Let's start with the definition. Two events, which I'll call A and B, are disjoint. If they contain no outcomes in common. A second definition, correct. Perhaps I should expand this title a little bit. I forgot that I was also going to talk about this other thing. A set AC, which we write that whenever you see an event to the power of C, we usually say A complement. <clears throat> That's how you would read this. So a set A complement <laughs> is the complement of A if all outcomes not in A are an A complement. So I have two pictures of this. <clears throat> and <clears throat> since we're about to do Venn diagrams, we have yet to. These photos might not make as much sense as they will <laughs> tomorrow, but I think they're still informative just visually. Note these are disjoint. events, and these are complements of each other. And note that if I'm in A, I'm definitely not in B, right? So if there's a point in A, it can't also be in B. They're separated with this like white space in the middle. And note here that A and AC take up the whole sample space. And what this means is if I drop a random point, so if I just close my eyes here and put a point, I'm going to end up in either A or AC. There's no way that I can end up in something that's neither A nor AC, right? Whereas if I did this on this picture to the left, if I close my eyes and picked a point, I'm going to be in A or B, or I could be outside of A. I could be in neither A nor B. So in this case, I ended up in B if I close my eyes and go like that. Oh look, I was in neither A nor B. So these aren't comp these are not complements, but these are complements. This picture on the left is just an, it's just visually trying to get you to understand what disjoint means. So here are two examples. Again, we're gonna have more practice with all these new ideas. And I'm gonna give us a more concrete example, less visual. Say we tossed a coin five times and recorded the number of times we get heads. <clears throat> Consider the following events. A, we get heads no times of the five times we drew it, one time, two times, or three times. I'll call the event B, we get heads five times. 
I will call the event C. The event we get heads three, four times, four times, or five times. And I will call the event D. The event we get it heads four times, or we get heads five times. So which of these events are disjoint and which of these are complements of each other? So <clears throat> I would say that Oh my goodness, excuse me. I actually just woke up, so my brain is moving a little slower than it might usually. I definitely see one that's, okay, okay, so A and B. Are disjoint. Because you'll note that all of the outcome, there's no overlap in the outcomes of A and B, right? A contains the outcome 0, 1, 2, and 3. B contains the outcome 5. There's no outcome that shows up in both of them. I would say, in contrast, C and B are not disjoint. And that's because both C and B contain the event five that we flipped a coin five times and every single time showed up heads, right? A and D are complements. If we flip a fair coin five times, the entire, the, all of the options are 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, or 5, right? Those are all the possible number of heads that we could observe from flipping a coin five times. And every single one of those events shows up in either A or D, and there's no overlap. So A contains 0, 1, 2, and 3, D contains 4 and 5, and together they have the whole sample space. So we would call these complements of each other. We could also say that a, the complement of A is equal to D, or A equals D complement. But these I might leave you to think about yourself. <clears throat> so the last thing I believe I want to do is I want to just state the laws of probability. Much time I have. Yeah, I'm just going to state the laws of probability, which is the next thing we want to talk about. And I'm going to use it as an example in our next lecture. So, last thing. Here, I'm going to make it dramatic. Laws of probability. Law one, for any event A, the probability of A is between zero and one. So note this little shorthand here, if I do like a P and then open parentheses, close parentheses with some sort of event inside of it, we say that as the probability of A. Okay, so that's event one. It has to be between zero and one, which makes sense because as we learned before, a probability is actually a long-term proportion, right? A proportion of the total times that some event happens. And proportions are always between zero and one. This shows up in one of our laws, law two. P of S is equal to one, where S is the entire sample space. So I believe I mentioned this before when I was talking about our sort of probability density model with the normal in the first example, but all of the probabilities in the whole space, all of them need to add up to one. 
because if you look at every single possible event, the probability of something happening in the whole sample space needs to be equal to one. And that's just a consequence of how you define your sample space. Law three. If events A and B are disjoint, then probability of A or B of either of them happening is equal to the probability of A plus the probability of B. And this is something that we're going to work with and motivate a little bit more, but it is just something that is true. So if you determine that two events are disjoint, you can say that the probability of either of them happening is just the sum of their respective probabilities. Law four, the probability of the complement of A is equal to one minus the probability of A. Is the complement of A. Right? So I think that's a bit it about it for this video lecture. I wanted to just show you these laws and we are certainly going to come back to them. I'm gonna give you more examples of them and we're gonna get practice to what each of them actually means. And I believe that is it for this video lecture. Sorry, I was a little sleepy today. I will try not to do the video lectures in the future immediately after I wake up in the morning because I think that makes me a little slow. See you tomorrow.